This video went viral and I have never been trolled so hard in my I, life. I was, I was about to ask you about Yeah, that. it was insane. And a lot of people say, you know, but why are you reading those comments? Well, when they come on your page, yeah. I don't read the things that people say on when I'm on Studio 10 and if they've got it on their Facebook page. I don't read that. Because there's going to be people that don't understand. There's going to be people that it's going to bring up their shit. There's going to be mean motherfuckers everywhere, always. <laughs> you know? And so I choose not to read in other places. But when it comes onto your own page, yeah. and I was checking comments and things from my event in Sydney and promoting my book, it was just like negative comment after i've never experienced like 24 hours of like i get it like when these kids or you know you're getting trolled yeah. online just bang 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 mean stuff yeah. and i ended up doing a post only the other day which is maybe that's what you saw mm. and they were quite nice the comments that people had said like and they were still mean yeah but these comments were horrific and i questioned again you know how going back to the girl yes. that messaged me yeah. when my book came out, I started to question my message. Like, do I get in my bra and undies? Do I do this? Am I doing? Am I putting these other people at risk that want to come with me? Da, 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 and just started questioning everything. And what I realized in that moment was I was scared. I was just scared. I was genuinely scared, and fear had been fear was re rearing its head. I started to maybe question what they were saying. Was is this true? And then. I had to come back to myself and I reached out to a couple of my girlfriends who are leaders in that space. Mm. And then again, it just came back to the conversation is bigger than you, mate. This is your test from the universe. Yeah. If you really want to change the world heights, which is what, you know, the impact, you know, that mean you, that's what we want to do. Yeah, of course we want to be of service. If you really want to do that, yeah. then you're going to have this. Welcome everyone to another episode of Secrets in the City. I'm your host, Dr. Catherine Isco, although everyone just calls me Dr. Cat. Yes. And gosh golly, do we have, I just know this episode is going to be everything I wanted for this podcast <laughs> because my guest just has such an incredible and colorful and rabbit hole kind of background. And funnily enough, we spent so much time together in these chairs. Oh. Without further ado, Heidi, welcome back. Oh my gosh, I feel like just I've gone back in time, I know, but I'm right? a totally different person. And I, oh my god, I just got goosebumps. Well, I have goosebumps too because I mean we're obviously going to get into it, but there is just I have to say before we get started, you've been such a pivotal part of where I've how I've got to today, and I say that with so much love. And admiration and I know I'm getting teary as well because honestly there was times that I sat in this chair that I thought that I was never going to feel how I feel today like and it's because you know you've been a massive part of my journey and you're a huge chunk right there in the middle when I was working in radio so I am honored to be here well yeah just keep on talking, oh, I talking. <laughs> it means I get emotional when people say that because you know, there's three things that I love doing in life, hugging people, helping people, and buying shoes. Oh. But it's really the helping people. And yeah. I always say I've had a successful day if someone message, messages me and just said, you know, that last post just made a difference. Mm. And hearing you say that because it got bumpy for a while there. Oh, my God. It so got bumpy. really bumpy. And I remember you sitting in this chair, and I actually sat down on the ground. Yes. And was just holding oh. your legs. Do you remember that? Because I could feel like you were fighting it. Mm. You were fighting just being yourself. And, yeah. I, and I knew you had to get through it. it. <laughs> the whole episode was just getting us crying. I think so. But I yeah. just remember holding your legs and I knew that it was going to go one way or the other. And I knew in my heart that you were going to go to where you are today. Mm. But it's like that holding you, your hand when I was saying, like when someone's in a dark cave and they don't know which direction to go and then they start yeah. getting scared and angry and that's where you were. Oh my God. And like I said, just so many layers and it wasn't just, you, you just helped me f exactly that, what you said, like find myself. Because working in breakfast radio and TV and, you know, the public space, 
I arm it up and it's been a journey now in de-armoring and you know wearing all those masks and everything and yes of course i'm sure i still have masks at times do you know what i mean that i put on or and my armor goes up or whatever like it's a work in progress um but i that's what i that's what was the big cracking point for me and just i spent so much time in my head mm. it just would never ever stop and i think working in that public space with a lot of egos my co-hosts um, the public having an opinion on you for someone who actually was petrified really of what people thought of them. I'd put myself in a really, you know, tough position. The worst position yeah. ever. And yeah. I remember, and I, I was reminded of it um, in your book, which we were yep. definitely going to get through. Um, there was a comment from a guy, I believe this was down in Bunbury. And yeah. He said something in the effect of, and I, I, I can't even say it, like, you're fat and you're not funny and you yeah. should be on the radio or yeah. something to Yeah, that and I think he's like, you have more chins than a Chinese phone book or something like that as well. Like it was, and now like I can actually laugh and go, whatever, like what are you doing with your life, mate? <laughs> Excellent point. Yeah. Excellent point. And, you know, I think like I actually, and this was one of the things when I was thinking about this whole concept of this, you know, secrets and stuff like that, what we keep and that. And I'm like, I've actually been an asshole to people and said things too. And so I put those in the book to paint the picture of why I have some of my issues. It's not just what they've said, but the stories that I created from possibly one interaction with one person, you know, like that comment. Yeah. And it actually made me reflect a lot on yeah. what I've said. And this comes up a lot for me now recently, I think as I'm evolving and as I'm really, you know, developing myself personally, it is, I'm reflecting a lot on like some of the comments that I've made, you know, or at high school when I didn't have this awareness and, you know, like, and probably did say some really nasty things I to know. people. Yeah. I know. And, and I think, and I sit there and I think like, fuck, well, are they sitting in a Sykes chair today reliving like that one comment that I said? Maybe. Yeah. But I, I would step back and say, at least you have the self-awareness to say, you know what, I did that and I potentially hurt someone. Yes. Whereas a lot of people would just go through life and just say, well, they deserve it or, you know, they'll be okay. You actually are compassionate enough to think that. Which yeah. Which shows me that change is happening. Oh, and writing this book brought up so much that then I've like had to continue to heal. So it came out in October last year and Funnily enough, is this funny? I don't know. But I received a troll message, a quite a long troll message from someone I went to high school with. And they had said that I, and I was actually going to talk about this in my podcast and I haven't actually talked about this publicly. I wrote something in my book from a couple of things that had happened years ago, but there was actually something that happened really recently. And it made me, I questioned publishing my book because I was so scared of people coming out with pitchforks being like, she's a fake, she's a fucking asshole, she's not really this good person, because I know I'm a good person now. Mm -hmm. But there are times in my life where I haven't been. Yeah. And I've treated people like shit. My mum, my dad, my brother, my husband, you know, my son too, and you know, then all of these other people that I've come across too. Like I'm not a perfect person, but it's and I know, but like that it was oh, yeah. huge for me. And I received this message and I am sure that it was from the person who messaged me several years ago when I first started working in the public eye and they put a name to their selves back then. So it was a girl I went to high school with. Right. But the way that it came through and I just questioned everything. I questioned who I was. I questioned like maybe I am this person that they're saying that I was and um, it was huge for me to like work through and I remember getting the message and I felt sick like I wanted to vomit. And look, if I reflect on the message, they're probably not that aware themselves with how they approached it okay. and didn't give me their name or anything like that. It was very attacky. Yeah. But there was felt like there was some truth in there. Wow. And can you, can you give us a Do you know what? I was going to try and bring it. I was like, I should really look it up now, shouldn't I? Why don't you look that up? And yeah. I just want to read Ooh. one quote from your book that I believe is really accurate for what you're saying, which is, I overthink almost everything. I wake in the middle of the night, replaying conversations over and over in my head. Did I offend so-and-so when I said that? 
what if she hates me? I'll sometimes lay awake for hours at a time, mm-hmm. analyzing and deconstructing situations or conversations, which is dead accurate about what we're talking about right yes. now. It's, it's really, and I mean, who doesn't do that? And I think the more you replay it, the more you dig yourself into this deep, dark hole. And it just makes it worse. It's kind of like, you know, those old um, toys that you put in water. They, they're tiny, tiny, and then you put them into water. And then oh, they, they grow? Yes. It's kind of like a thought in your head. Yeah. Expands. Yeah, and that's it. The remuneration was so massive for me. Mm. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. But basically, um, she said that I was really loud, obnoxious, rude made other people feel like shit because i was so arrogant and all of these things that i was like fuck i don't like i can tell that i would have probably like i was loud at times and i am the clown and you know and i now i get paid to be that part of my person but you know i've since becoming a mum and seeing like you know the things that i don't want to say to memphis and you know don't like I don't want to say to him don't be loud don't be this don't be like do you know what I mean that like it was all these things coming up and I think because like I ha- I had received a message which I write about in my book in 2013 how a girl said that I was a bully at school yeah. and so it really made me go like fuck maybe I aren't, I'm not this good person and maybe I'm not a good mum like I literally question and then I remember Memphis running in the front door after his day at daycare and he wanted to give me the biggest cuddle and I'm so emotional here. And I felt intense shame, intense shame to be his mum and intense shame to, you know, to be Griffo's wife, to publish this book because I was like, oh, I was an asshole if that girl, what she's saying is true. Like I believed everything she said in the message. Yeah. And then I spoke to a couple of girls that put together our reunion and they kind of think that they know who it was because apparently someone did ask me not to go, which is like a whole nother level. Like I said, I, and this is me, I've never spoke about this publicly. Um, and so I was going, you know, I had to really sit there and reflect and, and it actually brought me to my last chapter in the book where I speak about being unapologetic. And yeah, and I, and I think to be the person that I am today, being unapologetic doesn't mean I'm not apologizing for the behavior or the things that I've said or, you know, the way that I've treated people like a staff member or, you know, that I might've worked with 20 years ago or whatever it was, Mm -hmm. I know I can be very abrupt. Mm -hmm. And so part of me becoming unapologetic was actually really reflecting on those moments and taking ownership. And I did put in there, like if I have ever upset you or offended you, or, you know, you feel like, I haven't treated you well I would actually really love to hear from you so that I can apologize mm. you know and that's where I got to and it's like so being unapologetic is I think massive reflection and taking ownership and then being able to work through it wasn't easy mm. and those days felt really dark and I was in the middle of publishing this book and I had to really find this inner strength and resilience and what I came to was that the conversation is bigger than me and there's so many people that are getting bullied. There's so many people that are treating people like shit on the internet. And then we're wondering why our kids are telling each other to kill each other on the internet. And it's like, well, are you seeing what the parents are writing? And seeing monkey the things. Monkey, 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 yeah. Monkey, monkey, yeah. So I was like, I have to speak out about this. And I remember just grabbing Memphis and hugging him and telling Griffon, I just had tears running down my eyes. And he was like, babe, you know, you can't change that moment. But he's like, you can reflect. And, you know, we kind of spoke about it. And then I got on the phone to some of my girlfriends from high school. And I was searching for that validation. Like, was I mean? Was I this? Was I that? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, one of my girlfriends was like, you know, we were all mean. Like, we genuinely were. We have to take ownership for that. There were times where we were mean to other people. And there was people mean to us. And, you know, but Heidi, you're choosing to work in the public eye. Not everyone's going to like you. People are going to have stories about you. And you don't have to believe everything that's said either. You you are the only one that knows your truth. But I think, like I said, the thing that hurt the most was I'm, like, reflecting. I'm, like, fuck, I was an asshole at times. I have so much. I know so much to say in there, isn't there? And the main thing that's coming to me is again that sort of dark cave analogy. There's so many people who want to change, and they start changing. They start feeling that discomfort, that anger, that sadness, um, that shame, 
and they get in that cave and the problem is they say I don't like it in here I'm going to go back to what I know what what is comfortable the and comfort zone like, yeah oh. and then they're like oh, okay this feels better this is where quote unquote this is where I should be yeah but they don't understand that it's it's through that not to that but through that is where you start to change and oftentimes people say okay I've done I've done the work take a deep boo you know I'm gonna be this awesome person I'm like nope then there's another case oh it's then yeah there's another it's case. daily isn't it it's like it hourly is. <laughs> it is and I would say a very small percent of the population want to do that and I don't blame them mm. oh, oh my god and this is I mean oh you god. like I speak about this now like exposure therapy and I talk a lot about like the fear so I love that you talk about the cave analogy because for me I've been reading the book to Memphis you know we're going on a bear hunt did you ever read that when you're a kid and it's like yes. yeah and so you can't go like and then they go on the bear hunt which is obviously the bear hunt is like the big fear right like who wants to fucking go on a bear hunt like that's really uncomfortable and scary and they go through the windstorm and then they go through the mud and then we've got to go through the river and the snow and all this stuff and when they're saying it they're like we can't go over it we can't go under it. We've got to go through it, which is exactly what you said. Oh and I was like, shit, they've been trying to teach us this for years. years. And it wasn't until I read it to my three-year-old son that I was like, oh, my God, I, that's what I do. I choose to go on a bear hunt every fucking day, you know, and that's yes. uncomfortable and it's scary, but I've got to go through it to get to the other side and yeah so when you said that cave I was like oh that's what I, yeah that's, that's it that's it yeah so how I mean obviously you've gone through multiple caves. oh my god so many since we've sat here yeah <laughs> and what like tell us how did you get through each cave like who was there who was not there mm. what did you do well I think probably the biggest turning point for me was when we sat in these chairs before I was working in radio and you were what I'd been searching for, you know, like someone to actually hear me mm. and see me and understand me and also validate that my feelings were real. Mm. And that's what you always gave to me, you know, mm. and I, and that's why it was just honestly, like I said, I just sit here in so much gratitude and you were such a massive part. Like there's a book a chapter in my book that's about oh, you. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, you're a new friend in this current. <laughs> Yeah, I expect that on the wall over yes, there. Totally. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was talking about unfollowing people on Instagram because yes. working in the public eye, I always was comparing myself to people. And do you remember when I sat in these chairs, it was I was so obsessed with the way that I looked. Yes, so I remember obsessed. there was one girl. Yes, one yep. girl that I think was very, very successful. Yeah, in my in radio, and I talk about her, and she's one yeah. of my good friends. And I was kind of mentoring her, and then she blew up online, and it was I just couldn't. It, you talked about like you know those obsessive thoughts. I just yeah. couldn't let it go. And then there was also Charlotte Crosby, who I fucking love from Geordie Shaw. But I was I would always watch how much weight she lost, and watching. Do you remember I always used to follow yeah. accounts that had. The weight loss, like before, this and, and, before and afters. Yeah. And I remember you saying to me, and this was so, this is one of the very first things that started to unlock me understanding my brain and like removing that kind of stuff so that I was letting go of comparison. And um, I remember you said to me, well, let's kind of do a, a test. And you said, like, unfollow all these accounts, but like, was really the awareness around when I was doing it, what my brain was saying. And yes, because I think you said and i remember this is you found them inspirational yeah and i i, I don't know if you remember my yeah. face i was like do you <laughs> let's let's talk about that yeah like, let's let's you know dig down a bit and then I, basically my head was like bullshit yeah yeah bullshit and and that's the thing i liked the people but i wasn't fine like those and and this might be you listening right now you might be following these accounts obsessed with trying to lose weight all the time weighing yourself every day which was me measuring myself in the mirror 20 times a day like you know seeing how much weight i'd lost or put on or how bloated i was and i remember following these accounts and i said that to you and then when i did the whole kind of it was a couple of weeks i i um muted them or unfollowed yes. them yeah. and then when i came like came back on it was like we'll see how you feel when you yeah. go back to them and that's when it was like oh no they're not inspirational uh -huh. they were actually triggering me because i noticed how clear my mind was when i was on socials for those two weeks i wasn't having those negative thoughts 
And then, so I actually ended up teaching a whole bunch of people that, you know, that tool because it's like, it's so fucking easy. It's but so you don't realize that it's hard. Yeah. Right. Because you, there's two, two people in your mind. They're like, no, you're, you're stronger than this. You're, you don't, you're not jealous of them. You yeah. You're inspirational and you have to, you know, that's that person in the cave saying, no, 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 don't go that way. It's even scarier. Yes. When you go back to what you know. And you have to talk through that and learn that sneaky person's language. Yeah. Yeah, well, you were, so I speak a lot about confidence now. And, you know, my book's called Drunk on Confidence because I was always the girl who was drunk and finding my confidence through being drunk. Yeah. You know, sleeping around. Well, this is obviously before husband and boy, you know, when yeah. you were for the, here for the Griffo ride. But, yes. you know, before that, it was like getting drunk and finding that confidence on the weekend where people thought I was funny. I could, I was wearing clothes and not feeling that comfortable. So I would drink to take away the emotional labor of thinking about it. And no. you, yeah. No. I, would numb, I was numbing no. my, no. Girl yeah, I was numbing those inner mean girls. Yes. And so you, I remember even another massive moment for me was when I went on holidays with Griffo and we ended up getting engaged and so, yeah, sorry. yeah, and, yeah. It's like, and you, we, I'd come to a session with you, and I'd never been on a holiday yes. where I hadn't been obsessed with how much I would put on, what I was eating, you know, that emotional toll. And it was the first holiday that I ever went on. So it must be in 2017, and yes. I'd been working with you, and I went on this holiday, and we got engaged, and it was amazing. Um, and it was, you know, all that pressure going on in my head. But I remember getting back and going like, fuck, I didn't think about my weight the whole entire time. And I wore swimmers, you know, and I remember getting some photos in my swimmers, which was so huge for yeah. someone who had always covered up her arms. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that they were like, but that was the work that we've been doing, like the awareness that, mm -hmm. you know, um, really trying to understand those inner mean girls mm -hmm. at the beginning. And then from since I, you know, have had little methods and yeah, yeah and I left radio and I realized and published my book obviously and can't forget that yes. um but I realized that I couldn't keep going the way that I was going and I had this huge breakthrough moment mm. and it was when I was 30 weeks pregnant and I remember I wanted to buy a bikini which was like just out of the question mm. and one of my girlfriends was like no I think you could she's like if everybody's pregnant like who gives a shit yeah and she just gave me this permission slip and i remember going down to kmart or target wherever i bought a 30 dollars string black bikini and i remember standing in the mirror and the mean girls were fucking loud like the like girls in the, the cave that you talk about or i talk about you know the inner mean girls in my head and they were loud as fuck mm -hmm. really mean like you can't wear that that you're so fucking disgusting even though i've got this like beautiful baby belly <laughs> like yes. it did look like i'd smashed a few hamburgers i wasn't super wrapped which i think you and i had done some sessions when i first found out i was pregnant and my yeah. weight stuff came Came up hugely for me no oh. <laughs> yeah because I was you know because you couldn't tell that I was pregnant and I was starting to that weird limbo zone. yeah I was in the weird limbo zone and I remember sitting in here and then when I ended up going off to you know my 30 weeks uh, I think we went on our baby moon in Brew right. and I remember going okay fuck it I'm gonna just put this bikini on and I remember standing on the beach and Griffo was just teary and he had these tears running down his eyes because he'd just taken 5,000 photos of me or whatever. I was like posing in all these poses and he was like, what's happening? Like, who are you? And he said, this is just so beautiful to see this confidence. And, you know, he got quite emotional, even though now he's like, oh, did I? I don't remember that. Blah, blah. And I'm like, you were such a pivotal moment. Yes. And I remember looking down at my tummy. I didn't know it was Memphis. You know, I didn't know if it was a boy or a girl. And I remember thinking, I can't go on the way that I'm going on with all of the noise. I cannot pass this on to this child. Like yes. it really stops now. And so everything that we've been working through, all of the other things that I've been doing, just kind of just snowballed into this big like ball. And yes. it was just kind of like I threw it in the ocean and it just, everything just kind of dissipated that. Is that yeah. the right word? Like, or, yeah, you know, yeah. exploded. And yeah. from there, honestly, I barely ever question the way that I look I it was like this moment of acceptance that I was like no 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 you aren't gonna win girls yes and not today Satan. not today and not then today. 
and that for me now, as I say to many people, like through all the different things that I do, and I do so many different things now, but it was that ripple effect of that one area in my life that I was consumed with, my body, is now like opened up this space in my mind, but it was like just rippled into other areas, you know, and the confidence had come through to speak on more stages. Because yes. if you remember, I was so scared to speak on stage, even though I was a radio person. Which is crazy. I love yeah. that. It's so true that sometimes when we find that block and we yeah. Yeah, lift it out, we lift out that cork, it's it's amazing how um, you know, it goes to all different areas, but especially in your relationship because Yes. I don't know, you know, when you talked about like the Griffo era, yes. I remember that probably more even more vividly yes. than you talking about your body because I, I, you know, I paraphrase here or, or I sum it here, but it was like, I don't, why would this guy like me? Yes. Oh my God. A hundred percent. Oh, and he's going to leave me. Yeah. He, um, mm -hmm. he never, ever mentioned my weight ever. ever. And he saw how obsessed I was with like the weighing myself, the, you know, measuring myself mm -hmm. and, you know, like I said, holidays, not being able to relax and, you know, ended up drinking so much on holidays because I couldn't switch my brain off. Yes. So that's just what I would do to switch my brain off. Yes. And yeah, he, and I genuinely thought, and because maybe he didn't propose for fucking ages. I remember, and I, I remember that. So that was, was just, and it was almost like you were fighting for it because you're like, if I could just get that, like I can get that validation. Yes. And it was I'm glad you agree. Like, yeah. Oh my God. A hundred percent. But I, I, I guess for me, everything came from the weight. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that was the anxiety the mm -hmm. you know, that I would experience and everything. But it's funny. We talk about that with Griffo because we're now going through, you know, marriage, like five years this year, 10 years together and having a child. Like I genuinely understand why people get divorced after children wow, because you, yeah. And you just drift. You know, and then having my career, like I put my career on hold, like I left, yeah. you know, and then I published my book. So yes, I've got other parts of my passion that I was bringing out, mm -hmm. but this identity that I was every single day uh, that I hugely identified with, and then he left FIFO and we lived together for the first, first time, time full time with a baby. And then he didn't have a f switch that went click. I'm a dad. I know what to do. He looking back and reflecting, yeah. We shared a lot on our podcast called First Time Parents and we like we pretty much documented our time as first time parents. But what we probably didn't see in now like in reflection is that he definitely had like postpartum connection struggles and you know I think the guys like although the woman has been through much so much physically her identity emotional she's yeah. just the feeding machine there is this part that I feel like we do really need to nurture these dads because I've seen it like he mm -hmm. I had time, I guess, to like go through my identity when I was going through my pregnancy, like the loss of that person. Yeah. And then in those first few months, but for him, it was a whole other ball game. And you know, girls talk, we talk, I've sit on this podcast, I'm sharing and you yeah. know, whereas they don't. And so their backpacks just get really fucking heavy. Yeah. And I honestly, Dr. Cat, like he's only just got his spark back in his eyes. Like he, yeah. And our whole season three of First Time Parents is going to be about our relationship. Like we're going through relationship therapy wow. and, you know, and this is the honest truth. Six months ago, I was ready to walk because I was like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I wanted to walk. So this is why this came up because I was always the girl that was so scared that he was going to leave me. And I wanted him to change and it was the only thing because he was just stuck in his rut. Like yeah. he was coming home drinking, he'd lost all motivation. He works his fucking ass off. He's a great, you know, he's he's a great manager at his new place. Like his his career's going amazing. Yeah. But you know, he works nine hours a day. Like he's and he just he lost all motivation. He kept talking but not taking any action. Right. And I honestly like was going through all my book stuff and so much was coming up. But I literally remember us screaming one night. I remember holding Memphis's hand and I was like, I just want to fucking divorce. Like, and it just came out my mouth. And then for me, the person who would always probably scream my communication out in our first bit of a relationship because I didn't know how to communicate, I just shut down. And when I reflected, I was like, do you know what? The last few months I haven't fought for us. Because all I did was I felt like I fought for us for those first few years of Memphis's yes. life. 
and I'd given up. I'd been, I was doing everything for my book and this and that. And I said to him, and he was like, I just feel like I want to run sometime. And he had tears in his eyes. And I said, well, fucking run. Because do you know what? I said, for the first time, I want to see what it feels like. Because I want us to actually see what it feels like to see if this is going to, like, that you're going to fight for us. Because I said, have you noticed? I've stopped fighting. And he, that was massive. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I'm going to need therapy. I, I know. But oh you know me, God. I can't, I'm like, I'm, I'm very honest in this because... You know, Griff and I, like, we're not there anymore. And it's just, but we also, like, believe that we want to save other people's relationships. Like, we just have this human, like, human aspect in our yeah. selves that, like, that's why we, we want to be of service. We want to be of service. And we actually find talking on our podcast has saved our relationship. And mm -hmm. that ha I reckon it saved us those first few years of Memphis because we had conversations where we weren't getting angry or defensive or, you know, those patterns, behaviors from, you know, watching our parents. And so we actually used to hear each other. And then we had that phase where we both got lost with, and we drifted apart and I was focusing on my business. All my needs were getting met there. He was, you know, he was actually probably just, like you said, lost and resentful lost. and yeah. resented Memphis. Like had a lot of anger and resentment towards our son because he changed everything. Yes. You know, like it obviously it that's what, you know, that's what he was feeling and thinking. Yeah. And just recently it's like his spark is back and our spark is, you know, back. And so I guess I want to share this because I feel like so many parents go through this, Absolutely. but it's not a huge honest thing. It's kind of like, it's hard. And then you just kind of get on with it. Yes. And it's like, well, no. Mm -hmm. What about the actual conversations from this, mm. you know, like, because I fully, if you look, 50% of people get divorced and mostly, most of it happens after kids. Yes, it sure does. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it, <laughs> there's a bit of a few bombs for you. Oh my God. And we haven't, I mean, who cares about the secret that you chose? I mean, it's redundant now, but. <laughs> there's so many secrets in this. <laughs> so many secrets. And, um, you know, I uh, can't remember when, but, um, actually maybe I haven't said this publicly, but, um, my partner and I, Vlado, yeah. uh, broke up twice at the beginning of this, or what, what are we in? 2023. Oh, no, so it would have been last, so a year ago. Wow. A year ago. And I've always said, oh, I'll do a podcast about it. But it's funny when it's almost like we did drift apart in so many ways, yet we are, uh, you know, it was the best thing that ever happened yeah. to us. Well, I got this yeah, but at that time, even we were, I was sitting in my office chair, he was sitting here, and we were trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to do with the apartment? How are we going to sort that out? Like to that point that we were arranging, you know, separate. Like, Separate, yeah, separation, yeah. And I was thinking, do I want to, like? I literally went through the pattern of so maybe I'll move back in with my dad for a bit, and then I'll you know go back to Toronto. I was going through all those plans wow. that I had to that extent. But the reason why I'm saying that is because it really depends on whether you want to fight for each other. Hundred percent. And if there's something there, and I remember, obviously, my girlfriends are wonderful, and one of them said, you know going through like this is what happened that and I was angry and I was sad and I was this and that and she just asked me a simple question but do you love him and it was yes yeah like no question I know I'm gonna start yeah me too <laughs> and it and I guess that was my litmus test it was there's always gonna be shit there's always, always gonna be those annoying things there's always gonna be values that we don't agree on or yeah align on, which is massive but the question is do you love each other and if there is that love you know, and we, we went to counseling as well. Yeah. And this is the thing. I feel like counseling gets a bad rap. There's still a stigma around it. And I'm like, even I say to my girlfriends, if you're in a relationship and you love someone, like this is what I believe. And it's the first few years people think, oh, but we're fighting. We're doing this. And it's like, so we should break up. And it's like, no, no. actually that's a fucking good thing that you're fighting because you're seeing like what your patterns are. You're seeing like yeah. what shit you're saying and how you can react. And if you get the right help, you can actually work through that. You, through it. Yeah. 
back to that. Yeah, that. exactly. It's always through. Yeah, it's not around. It's not under. It's not over top. It's through. Yeah, and we spend so much time and energy thinking, oh, there must be a simple solution, which is breaking up. Yeah, I think that's the easy option. It's like so easy. I know that it's obviously technically with the house and kids and blah blah blah. Like I do believe that you know, but the hard work is the daily work that we do, and that's where Griffo and I like we are fucking working so fucking hard on our relationship Tell and us how Tell well us so how. we started the podcast again because yeah. that was a, like we said just it's like having a mediator in the room i was it's exact i was going to say the audience yeah. is like a mediator. yeah and so you you know there is times if you look back at our podcast and i'm like we have got hated each other we've cut each other off you could hear the tension but we still published it and now it's like you will see the growth in us if you go back and listen to some of our discussions and then now here we're having these really deep combos and here and asking questions whereas when you start to get like so one of the things that i'm struggling with at the moment is he doesn't think he wants another child and i do really and so that one. was it's huge because it's like well what do you do again like do i play into that whole like oh well, do we leave like do i leave but then it's like you got to find someone else and break up your whole family and yeah. if you're so yearning to have that baby yeah. right and then it's like, but I'm 40 next year. And so there's so many different things. So we were like, well, fuck, let's just do this publicly. And we, cause otherwise I shut down. Yes. If, if we try and talk about it, I hear him say like, I don't know if that's what I want. Like I instantly go into um, freeze yeah. and I'm like, I can't, I've got all these things I want to say in my head, but I literally can't get them out. Yeah. Whereas when we're on the podcast, it's like, okay, I actually understand why he doesn't want another kid. Like I get it. Like, and I hear that, like, I think it's so much his nervous system. Yeah. I think he's still operating from this kind of traumatic place that he was. And, like, his so his whole body says, fuck no, fuck no. Yeah. Like, yeah. look at this, Heidi, our careers. Like, our whole life pretty much blew up. Like, you left radio. I left this. We started this. We had this house. We had all this financial pressure. And now, like, interest rates, oh, all that yes. shit. And so instantly he's like, <laughs> once and twice shy. And then like with Memphis, how how tough it's been for him to like build that connection. And But I, what I keep holding on to is the work that we're doing now. I'm hoping that's going to bring us to a place. And also, um, Dr. Kat, I've just become so spiritual <laughs> that I'm talking to like guardian angels. I even talked to them before I came here and just trusting in a different way that, and I heard someone speak the other day and she said, She's, she's a spiritual leader and she's like, you think they put you on earth without a backup team? And that for me has just given me so much faith. Yes. That, because... I love that. Same. Her name's Rachel Grace, by the way. I heard her speak the other day. I will, like, I was like, what's her name again? But it was Rachel Grace. And she okay. said that and it landed so hard for me. Me too. Because, well, when I was in the thick of it with Griffo, one of the ladies that I'd been coaching with, Dom, she said have you spoke to you guys have you you know and for years i was like fuck off coming from a family that were atheists yeah you know logic science not yeah. when you're dead you're dead nothing happens rah, yeah. rah, rah, rah. so i've been too woo woo, too woo, -woo. Yeah. and like me that's probably such a huge part of the last three years for me is i've been going deep into that space and wanting to hear more and i remember just thinking like after that fight with griffo where it was like you know i'm not gonna fight for us right now yeah. i need you to and he has he's fucking fighting and it's so beautiful and it's so like sexy and i'm like excited and you know have this faith but i said i i started speaking to my nan and i started talking to her and i said can you just give me some kind of sign of love like white feathers memphis and i pick up feathers on the way to the beach and we say thanks universe more please and i was like but i they're, they're always black ones and i was like i just want a white one because I was like I need a sign yeah. anyway woke up the next morning Memphis and I were like let's go to Hillary's boat harbor today just you know somewhere different we can go down there not even thinking about how I was feeling that day before yeah. and what I'd asked for and when we got to Hillary's boat harbor because we normally go to Malaloo Beach every morning where we have our coffee and play I'm not joking hundreds oh. of white feathers just yeah scattered all oh, along the where like were. where we were and memphis was like mom look at this like you know this little three and a half year old like wanting to collect them all and for me i was just like what the fuck wow. what the fuck but then add more layers to this so i had that like oh yes that's and then i remember messaging dom and i was like 
so you know this happened but you know the logical brain comes in and she goes oh isn't it funny we ask for a sign and then when we get it we question it yes and uh and i was like oh my god so right so i've got okay that's it like that's our sign and it felt like there was peace and like i was ready and i was seeing griffo make all this effort yeah. we were just recently coming home so this is about six months later from my brother's 40th the other weekend and i was watching elvis on the plane and i was crying because that was my nan's favorite oh. artist and you know I just heard the song that he sings right at the end of the movie of the documentary about his life is, was my nan's funeral song. Oh, and I was yeah. sitting there like crying. And you know, they say you fucking cry on planes anyway. Like they say that's oh, the yeah. one place everyone just loses it. And Memphis just looked at me and I said to Griffo, like, whoa. And he was questioning, like, this is a three and a half year old kid. He said, Mummy, that was um, Nanny Brenda at Hillary's that day. <gasps> like, but he was questioning and stumbling his way through it as like a three-year-old, like, where is this information? Do you know what I mean? And I looked at Griffo and I was just like, oh, what the hell? How would he? And that's it. And the only thing that I can think is that because I was in that moment, just so thinking about my nan and crying because of this movie and stuff. And then him saying that, it just. And for no reason. For no reason. Came out of nowhere. Came out of nowhere. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. And so for me, wow. it's like, that's been a huge part of my wow. development into like Griffo and I taking our relationship and actually working through it, it has been this trust mm -hmm. and, uh, and calling in the backup team. I love the backup team. Same. Yeah. Gosh, it's, it's such an evolution. And I actually looked up the etymology, which is like the, where words come from. Oh yeah. The other day of evolution. Love that. And it's actually the unrolling of what has been rolled up. Oh. I was like, what? You so the never rolling expect. of what's been rolled up. Yeah. And I thought, isn't that funny? Because life kind of rolls us up, right? You know, the yeah. nasty people on the radio, you know, you start rolling into yourself. Yes. And, you know, the relationship, all of a sudden you protect yourself. You start being really quiet and you can't speak. And all these things roll you up. And then there's just something that is unrolling. You're yes. relaxing, and then you know you get rolled up again. Yes, and that's, yes. And I, that just hit home for me so much. Yeah, it's like such a visual. It kind of you think it's like a you know those those candies that like unroll and roll. Yeah, you know, but it almost sounds like you were rolled up in that moment, and yeah. that beautiful little boy just unrolled you. Yes. Oh my God, he has done that to me so much and you know you speaking of that I kind of see in my head you know as like I talked about like the armoring up yes yes and I think like that's what he's doing he's cracking me open and you know Griffo has done that in so many ways yes. but then I've also like you know shut down and covered it up and it's yes. like it's that whole thing of like you said you just something happens and then you start to unravel and then it's like no fuck, yeah. don't you can't come to my heart and that I think is like the biggest issue in society is we're mm. all walk, walk, walking around with armor, afraid of like, it's the fear, afraid of the fucking cave, afraid of the bear. Absolutely. And so we just keep our cards really close. And it is like Dr. Brené Brown, like, yeah. you know, the whole vulnerability piece, it all comes back to that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, that's why I think Griffo and I are able to work through what we're working through because we can be vulnerable with each other. Just you know, sometimes you know, need it to do it publicly. <laughs> heck, you know what? Whatever works, you yeah. do. Kind of yeah. Thing. And it's it's interesting you say that, like, you know, the cards and the armor and so forth. I was speaking to a lady that I'm going to be working with um, intimately with over the next few months. And she said she was looking at my videos and so forth. And she said, some may here, but she said, I don't feel like that's you. And this is from, like, videos from a while ago. Yeah. And it was funny. Exactly then, for the past couple of years, it's just been... Like, you had me. your armor on? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And you know, all this stuff happened, you know, last year. Yeah, with Lato and Lato and, yeah. Put everything, it was just like, I'm done. Yes. I'm done. And it's funny, you know, she, a stranger basically, saw it. Yeah. She called it. Oh, it, but isn't it fun? Like, that was the same when I did it on the radio all those years ago and spoke openly about my anxiety. And then I think that's kind of when we started we yes. working together then, or was it afterwards? After. After, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's funny because I think that's why I had to say it yeah. because I felt like people were starting to see mm -hmm. that I wasn't being me. Yeah. And so I totally yeah. relate to that. And now you're definitely you because you're even basically naked. 
Like, well, and no pun intended there. Oh, it's true. Like, uh, and you think about, like I said, the girl who sat on here, which, like I said, I feel like so much of it was around body confidence, although it was coming at me all different yeah, angles, and it was all about validation, validation from Gr Griffo, mm -hmm. validation from the public, validation from your, my parents, like all of those different things, which I'm still working through and still a work on progress. But mm -hmm. I would never have got my arms out, and then literally just recently, that's why you mentioned the naked thing. Yes. Uh, just did my first nude sunrise photo shoot with 20 women and this was huge for me i stood in front of them and led the way as i took each piece of clothing off with beautiful jana my um soul sister who we do a lot of her movement is it's safe to be soft so very much about like the de-armoring and yes. getting in the ring and you know fighting for yourself and exactly all the stuff we spoke about and then mine shed your shit so, you know, like get letting go of all the bullshit that we've told ourselves and, you know, all those years of self-hate and the baggage and, you know, I just do it in extreme ways. Exposure therapy and it doesn't sound like you at all. <laughs> well, you know, I go hard or go home, baby. That's and it. yeah, and I stood there and I remember for me it was like my vulva was out and my boobs and my tummy and my arms. Everything. And I just like we all went for a swim and you know at first it was like that little bit of scary like fuck they're really seeing me and they were feeling the same you know and then when we got out of the swim and we'd had all these photos it just felt so normal cat it just yeah. felt so normal and i stood there leading the group some people got dressed some people were eating and i stood there just naked yeah. and it now has unraveled more for me. Like I just went to International Women's Day event the other day, wore a kick-ass amazing suit, yes. but I actually had my tummy out, which people will be like, but you can get naked in front of people, so why not? And it's like, well, no, because these it's pants different. were quite tight. Yeah. There was a tiny, it was a tiny little boob tube and I had this big jacket on it, it got so hot. And the old Heidi would have just dealt with the sweat, the like yeah. hot, like fuck, can we yeah. go find an air con? I was like, no, I'm just gonna take it off. And it was this and moment. Nothing bad happened. Nothing it? bad happened. I didn't yeah. die. <laughs> Maybe someone judged me, but who cares? I don't know that. Yeah. I'm not going to give my power to them because I felt fucking hot. And so for me, that naked swim and that moment of standing and leading people, it was this moment of like an, another layer for me, like another, you know, yes. layer of even though I thought I'd pushed it so far and that I was really made it with my body confidence, I was like, oh, no, no, no. The emotional labor of clothes now and how you feel yes. in that this is the next level that it's you're going to push the through next cave. yeah yeah the, yeah, the, the next, next cave. cave yeah and so much so that i mean you weren't naked on channel 10. no i was wearing uh, my bra and undies on national yes. tv i'm going to be doing it again this week as oh, well i know yeah. tell us all about that and we'll, we'll put in obviously all the links of the yes. I'm watching it again. yeah yeah but tell tell us even how that happened and also like how does a network to say like yeah, we want we want a pretty much naked person on our they, show. They yeah. love it. They I'm love sure. And you know, I'm not the first person that stood in there in my bra and undies or swimmers. You know, Tara and Bromfit. Yes. I remember when she did her yes. book. She did her red bikini and stuff. And she's been such an inspiration for both of us. I know for 100%. her movement and now being Australian of the Year. And she's led the way for people yeah. like you and I to have these conversations and. The bra and undies thing just started because I just started stripping off on stage, like when I was doing my keynote speaking and getting down into my bra and undies to really show people because exposure therapy is so works for me. Like yeah. that's how I've pushed through so much shit. Yeah. And if you're in a safe space, I promise you it can work for anyone. Uh, absolutely. Like it's it's one of the best things that I've ever discovered. And the thing is, I was always doing exposure therapy. I just actually didn't know it was that. Yeah. You know, like through showing up on the radio every day when I was shit scared and like terrible at my job and had a fake laugh, like, you know, all those years ago. But I showed up and I exposed myself to the feedback, to those comments, to every single day. And so I was constantly, you yes. know, exposing myself. So the walk of no shame was us and our bra and undies in Perth. And I did it a year after Memphis was born. Mm -hmm. Because again, I was at this point where I was like, well, fuck, I am I can get photographed down the beach in my bra and undies. And I was trying to sell a self-love workshop. I had girls in my program and I'm like, well, what would be really uncomfortable? And I'm like, well, actually getting photographed in my bra and undies in a shopping center, in a busy shopping center, that would be like the most petrifying thing I could ever think of. So you've got to do it. <laughs> and then I pitched it to the girls in my, um, in my program and six of them who weren't even ready to get photographed on the beach said 
yes, honey, we'll do it with you. Or seven of them, I can't remember. And they were like, yeah, yeah we'll do it with you. Oh, you, you went up an escalator, I think. Yeah, I escalator. Remember. We literally just walked through and did all these crazy things around a shopping center that you were doing when you were wearing your clothes, going shopping with your family, doing your groceries or whatever. And we were met with unbelievable, like, cheers and tears and this empowering, like, life-changing moment. And I just remember being like, fuck, this is not scary. This is like what we're supposed to do. And some lady was like, what are you protesting? And I was like, we're not, we're here to, to you know, and then I was like, actually we are. We're yeah. protesting unrealistic beauty standards, the expectations that society and others put on us. And mm. all of that came up and I was like, wow. And then two weeks later, I got a phone call from um, SBS and they're putting together a documentary. What does Australia really think about obesity? Yes. And that's how it kind of all has compounded and that was two years ago and i'm still talking about it still about to do melbourne fashion week next week we're going to be going in our bra and undies crashing melbourne fashion week in between two shows in you know the area where everyone's having a drink and everything we're going to be coming out in our bra and undies we're going to be filmed and we're going to be on studio 10 that morning pumping it up yeah. um and then that's how the studio 10 stuff started i went on in my bra and undies for um when i was promoting my podcast and they loved my movement and they loved the message that i was doing and that was just promoting my podcast actually yeah. but we turned it into this 10 minute segment where it was all about women and empowerment and our bodies and the conversations around our bodies and getting in your bar and undies is not going to be for everyone and that's probably not everyone's next step to do it publicly yeah. but it might be your next step to do it in your bedroom and it might you know and sit and face yourself in the mirror and it might be your next step to walk out to the letterbox yeah or wear your bikini at the beach or buy it just even buy the bikini and have it in your house for three years like that's what i did yeah you know like i'm and so for me the glass ceiling, what well, is it the glass ceiling that I want to keep breaking yeah. through, you know, finding myself in the cave every day yeah. is like, say, going on Studio 10 again next week and then the Melbourne Fashion Festival. It's just the, you know, the challenges and the conversations that come from it. And before my last walk of no shame in the shopping center, I'd just been on Studio 10 in Sydney and I was promoting my book. I was on my book tour. I did a free event in Sydney. I was about to go to Melbourne and I, one of my videos went viral in the US of the walk of no shame. So again, this is two years after I ever did it. Wow. And so the conversation that can keep happening from this one empowering moment, and now I've turned it into, you know, several conversations and now networks wanting to work with it and continue the conversation. This video went viral and I have never been trolled so hard in my I, life. I was, I was about to ask you about Yeah, that. it was insane. And a lot of people say, you know, but why are you reading those comments? Well, when they come on your page, yeah. I don't read the things that people say on when I'm on Studio 10 and if they've got it on their Facebook page. I don't read that because there's going to be people that don't understand. There's going to be people that it's going to bring up their shit. There's going to be mean motherfuckers everywhere, always, <laughs> you know? And so I choose not to read in other places. But when it comes onto your own page yeah. and I was checking comments and things from my event in Sydney and promoting my book, it was just like negative comment after i've never experienced like 24 hours of like i get it like when these kids or you know you're getting trolled yeah. online just bang 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 mean stuff yeah. and i ended up doing a post only the other day which is maybe that's what you saw mm. and they were quite nice the comments that people had said like and they were still mean yeah but these comments were horrific and i questioned again you know how I'm going back to the girl yes. that messaged me yeah. when my book came out, I started to question my message. Like, do I get in my bra and undies? Do I do this? Am I doing, am I putting these other people at risk that want to come with me? Da, 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 and just started questioning everything. And what I realized in that moment was I was scared. I was just scared. I was genuinely scared and fear had been, fear was re rearing its head. I started to maybe question what they were saying was, is this true? And then I had to come back to myself and I reached out to a couple of my girlfriends who are leaders in that space. And then again, it just came back to the conversation is bigger than you, mate. This is your test from the universe. If you really want to change the world heights, which is what, you know, the impact, you know, that mean you, that's what we want to do. Yeah, of course we want to be of service. If you really want to do that, yeah. then you're going to have this. You're going to have people that don't understand. And in fact, what these people are saying is why you fucking want to get out there. That's it. And, and so it was just like, fuck, why is the universe doing this to me? But I used all my tools 
in that 24 hours before sitting in the hotel room because yeah. you know I'm away from my son my husband my girlfriends I'd been dr out drinking after my event in Sydney with my girls because you know we're celebrating not seeing each other for a couple of years yeah. COVID and then you know my book and everything and so when I'm low vibe that's you know tiredness exhaustion yeah. putting yourself out there yeah. you get the shame hangover and then people are negative so all these things I had to use everything in my tool belt and I journaled it out, I reached out to friends, I did some breath work, I asked for friends to help me with tools. I woke up the next morning and I was fucking ready to go. And I was like, yes. And that's what I think a lot of people don't have. They don't have those tools yes. or they're too afraid to reach out and say that they're scared. And that's what I did. I, I just cried yeah. and I said, I'm, I'm actually scared. I'm scared of that bear right now. Yeah. And so, yeah, and then that um, photo shoot in Melbourne is now how I've got to Melbourne Fashion Week now and they want to change the conversation around bodies and mm. the fashion industry seeing, you know, all body types as beautiful. So yes. that's a long story to get there, but we got there. <laughs> no, I love it. And I sometimes when I think about trolls and, and those comments, that's their cave. Yeah. They're in their own cave. They're scared. Mm. And when you're scared, you do two things. You either hide or you fight. Yes. Right? You know, fight or fear. Yeah. And when, you, when you're down, when you're feeling dark, you want to pull people into your darkness. Mm. I, I know it because I've done it before. Yeah. You know, oh, when yeah. You're, when you're, because I went through major, major depression, and all you do is you look around and you're like, they shouldn't be living that amazing life. How can I pull them down? Even though it might be yeah. just in my mind, you know, I'll start saying, oh, they're a bitch. Or, you know, yeah. the only reason why they're successful is because of luck or because of how they look. And you start to yeah project. Going, yeah, yeah. And you start, and then you find yourself in their cave or in someone else's cave. And I just, it's so, it's so easy to do. Yeah. It's so easy to oh. listen to the loud voices of others rather than the quiet voice of ourselves. Mm. And gosh, golly. So now tools. So you yes. say something? No, well, I was going to say it's interesting because like I get this question a lot too, like about trolls and I totally understand this. And this is where I'm like, oh, and I'd love to know your thoughts on this. Cause it's mm. like, yeah, these are like hurt people, hurt people. They say that, yeah. but then I'm like, aren't they just assholes as well? Like, do you know what I mean? Is it that they have to be going through? So, like, I do think that sometimes. Like, because good question. Like, do you know what I mean? Because some of these things are just blatantly just so mean. Yeah. And I'm like, are you really hurt, or are you just an asshole? Like, I think I think they're hurt. Yeah, and like I want to believe that, but sometimes, yeah. and it's like I know, you know, when I look back at myself at school, and I'm like, yeah, I definitely was going through that hurt stage like my brother was so depressed and I thought I was going to lose my brother and you know I was always the fat friend like I had all these body image issues coming up and always wanted all the boys wanted my friends but I know for me that was like a hurt thing yeah but then sometimes the way that I just treat my mum and dad like I'm like oh I'm just an asshole sometimes do you know what I mean yeah, like, I, I do and I'm just sort of thinking that you know the most there's always in high school the most popular people mm. right like they're on that pedestal yeah right? Even in their situation, and you know, I'm just you know, thinking, but if you're up on a pedestal, and even if your life is going perfectly, and everything is going right, and everyone loves you, yeah, that's almost in a worse position. You're mm. more scared, you're more fearful, because what if you lose it? Yes. So yeah. I almost think that, you know, being the big, Kaguna, right? Mm. That's a lot of pressure. Well, and that's how I used to feel, actually. Yeah. Like, you know, in working in radio, at, at school, we were the popular groups. And I did, I see, I look back and I thought that I was someone who was trying to be friends with everyone. Like I said, there was times definitely in the early years of high school, I'm like, yeah, I was just mean. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. just mean to people because it was like, that's the, what we just did. Like, yeah. which, I, like I said, absolutely no fucking excuse. Now, the awareness, it's like, that was that, you know, yep. just that mean girl shit. But yeah, looking back at myself, I'm just like, yeah, it just brings up a lot. A lot. Yeah. I think, and sometimes you think, okay, everything's going great. Mm. And that's when you're the most fearful, right? Yeah. And I, you know, it's that saying, waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, you know, back when people were in the army, they would be trying to sleep in bed and so a soldier would come back and they would come to the to the floor above and you know it's really thin floors and walls and so they would take off their army boot and it would go thud 
and then they couldn't go to sleep because they're waiting for the other shoe to drop. They know that something is going to make them restless. They know that something is going to throw them off. that analogy? Yeah, no, it's, it's actually where the saying came from. Oh, yeah. And is so, that not an analogy? No, no, no. <laughs> Me. I failed <laughs> English and published a book, guys. <laughs> but, but it's almost like, you know, when things are going well, do I deserve them? Yes. And that's what people are afraid of. Like they say, like the success, like a lot of people aren't scared of failure. They're scared of success, aren't they? Because if you get the success, then it's like, well, then you're going to get like a whole other, you know, a whole other can of worms. A hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No matter how high you get up. So, so when you mentioned tools and I think that's Mm. very applicable. So you have your shed, your shed? Shed your shit, which I created when I was, you know, had that breakthrough moment with Memph. Yeah. Now I sell it for literally 33 bucks online. You can watch through the videos. It's, I reckon it's the tools yeah. that I needed when I started on my journey. Do you know what I mean? Like 10, 10 years, like the three years when I had that breakthrough with Memphis where I wanted to like myself, it's like everything in there. Like I teach people again to like unfollow people, yeah. do an audit, do these things, like, but not just audit your socials, audit your actual life as well. And, you know, meditation is massive for me, just like finding that peace. And being vulnerable, like teaching people how to be vulnerable and stuff. So it's a really easy kind of thing. But I focus mainly more now on like my in-person events with the Shed Your Shit. And, you know, that's just, there's several tools in there. But for me, like, I guess the biggest thing when I really look at it is just saying what your fear is. Like, because when you say the fear, it's like what this whole podcast is all about. Like sure the secrets, is. the secrets are the fears, right? Mm-hmm. Of like what... They keep you small. They keep you small. And so I'm still a work in progress. There's still so many things that I want to share and say. And, you know, but the fear inside me is keeping me safe with with those for now. And I think that everyone, that's everyone, right? Like we're... Timing. Timing. I think timing is a massive, massive thing because I think even when you were sitting in this chair and I was standing on the ground, I still remember it wasn't time yet. Yes. It wasn't time. Oh, I had all this other work to do, girl. And you gave me, like I said, the space to speak my fears. You you have to. You have to because the, the whole thing, even in your position, and I think you'll find this, is you can't force someone to get naked. What you can no. do is stand stand next to them and wait until they're ready. Yes. Yeah. You know there could be a nudge there and a nudge there, but as you know, my dad, my dad never gave me advice. Yeah. He just guided me. Yeah. And the only that's the only way you're ever going to drive permanent change. Yeah. Is if you allow the person to do it when it's their time. Yes. So I think that's such a big one. That is such a big one. And especially like now being in the coaching space as well. Like, you know, I teach women like public relations, how to get themselves on TV, you know, promote their brands, build their brands in really epic spaces. It's the same thing. It's like, I can give you all the tools. I can tell you everything, you know, here to do. Mm -hmm. But ultimately it comes down to you. And if the timing's right, Mm -hmm. you know, it might be today that you might go like, oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, actually, no, I'm not. The fear might come up and it might not be till a year that you use something that, you know, that we've shared or taught. But that's one thing you saying that about your dad. You yeah. always gave me guidance and it was never like telling you, telling me what to do. Like you said, like giving yeah. me advice. It was really steering me with the guidance. And I just, yeah, I, I love that. And yeah, like I said, that's so much of, you know, when people ask for the magic pill or the advice or the tools, it's like, I've got all these tools. I do breath work. I did breath work in the hotel that day to release shit. I reached yeah. out to my friends. I meditated. I also watched Housewives because I fucking froth that. And it just yes. gives me that time out to not think about anything. You know, I turn my phone off. That's huge yes. because that flick for me of the mm-hmm. um, airplane mode mm-hmm. literally flicks my brain into like, oh, it's now time to rest, Heidi. Yeah. So, you know, there's those kind of things that I can sit here and tell you and some of them might work for you and some of them might not. But the biggest thing is allowing to have that space and the courage to start talking into your fears. So then you can go on your bear hunts. That's it. Yeah. And you, and like I said, you did that for me. It was those spaces. And now I create that for other people. You know, ripple effect. Yeah, yeah, it's the ripple effect. I think everyone listening right now, I think one challenge, you know, as we sort of close the conversation is I really think people should be challenged after this is even just have those shower conversations or when you're on a walk, just start thinking, what is something that really is scaring the crap out of you? Yes. Yeah. 
And just that you don't have to fix it, you don't have to do anything about it, you know, just sit with it and wonder. And, you know, for me, it's always going to be, I want everyone to like me. Yeah. That's oh, always. And I'm girl, gonna, I'm gonna I be, feel you, I see you. I'm going to be 103, <laughs> you know, with my crane, my, oh. my cane, and I'm probably going to be four foot tall by then, yeah. shrunken, and I'll still be going through the supermarket going, oh, did I say something wrong? I wonder if I've said something in it. You know, that's that's my thing. Oh, man. Like, I can relate to that so much. And when you read my book, you'll hear that too. <laughs> it, it is. It is. So I want to end with one final question. Yes. Give it to me, lady. What is the best advice you've ever received? Oh, that's tough. Because I have so many. Can I say something that I gave out the other night? A hundred percent. Okay. Give me any advice. I said this the other night when I spoke at an event and the crowd was just like, fuck. Like if tomorrow was your last day, think about tomorrow, right? And if it was your last day on earth, like would you be worried about what the person says to you at the beach? Yeah. Would I'd be running around with Memphis. I'd be taking as many fucking photos as I can. Would I be eating the cake, the whole cake with him? Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. I'd be smashing 10 burgers at Macca's and chicken nuggets and calling people that I haven't probably called in months. Connection. Connection. Mm. So, you know, like you probably can't live every day like it's your last with like going to Macca's and having 10 burgers <laughs> yeah. and, you know, and, you and, and yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, you know, eating a whole cake and all that, but it's like thinking it's, principle. it's the it's principle. principle. And it's like one thing I think we do as well is it's like we hold off going and seeing people and making an effort because life's too busy. Yeah. And I had a conversation with my best friend the other day and I said, I actually hate that everyone thinks I'm busy. And I really hate when people say, oh, but you're just so busy and they put that on you. Mm. And I'm like, I'm actually living my life. I'm not busy. Mm. I'm living my life. And mm. so are you. That's but it. let's make the effort to connect. And so a big thing I do is, you know, I try and send a message to a friend or connect with someone that I haven't for ages that I've been thinking about and I really want to do. And, you know, and I do stuff like that. And You did that with me. Yes. I think it was yeah. like, I can't even remember how many months ago. You yeah. just said, oh, I was just thinking about you. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And I said, was it a voice message? Yeah. yeah. Of course. And yeah. I love a voice message. Four voice messages. <laughs> each about two minutes long. <laughs> and I just laugh. I know. I love that. And isn't it bad? Because sometimes when people send me too many voice messages, I'm like, fuck, can you send it on WhatsApp or Voxer? Oh, no, on Voxer where you can speed people up. <laughs> So you can listen to them on like times four. I've never done that. Well, because you know, if you're like me and you love a good chat, it's like I'm gonna do that next time. I yeah. voice, voice message you, it's gonna be WhatsApp. But yeah, that's true. I think that's gonna be the number two takeaway is, and it it might even be connected. Mm. You know, maybe it's that person that you need to reach out to is on the other side of your fear. Yes. Yeah. Who knows? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I've got so many things that I've learned from so many people, you included, you know, and that's something that I'm forever grateful for. And I think when you've taken that first step of starting to go on that self-development journey, you need mentors. Oh my gosh, yes. You need to listen to podcasts like this. Absolutely. You need to fill your cup up reading books that like, you know, that are going to help you on those steps that keep you accountable, yeah. that, you know, keep you making those 1% changes. And so, yeah, there's just so many layers to it and you know like i said from the get-go it's just been such a pleasure like i feel like we've so much has happened but it feels like no time has passed at all that's right because we're still walking right next to each other yes we never stopped yeah i love that well, well thank, thank you. you oh gosh thank you thank you again to the audience for listening yeah and to sum it all up we're gonna put in all your links yeah, yeah, yeah. oh thank yeah. you check the show notes oh uh, no <laughs> i guess they're called show notes yeah that's a bit more professional mm. thank you again for listening <laughs> and never forget that every day is your chance to shine so yes. make it today thanks for listening Oh, thanks, Dr. Hat. Love you. <laughs> oh, oh, thanks, darling. That was good. Little disturbies. I oh, know. We didn't even get the secret, did we? I'm into my podcast. Oh, no, that's right. Oh. It's yours. Oh. <laughs> All the ring lights. Yay. Everything's happening. Good to be back in this chair. I know. Feels like psychology again. A psychology 101. Oh.